Hey, this is Nothing Lose But Yourself with Jamel Shabazz and Janelle Ajani. I can't wait. I want to welcome to the podcast, Janelle Ajani and Jamel Shabazz. I'm so happy to have both of you on. How are you? I'm doing great, brother. Thank you for having us. Wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you, Ricky. Janelle, how you doing, sister? I'm doing wonderful as well. Good, good, good. So I'm excited to have both of you for so so many reasons, and I'm I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna love on you for a minute. So just indulge me. Uh, first of all, I'm, again, I'm thrilled to have you both on. Uh, first of all, Jamel Shabazz, you're a photography legend. Uh, you're this legend as a human being and a black man. And um, although, you know, my work sits in a very different space than yours, you are an inspiration to me in so many ways, and most importantly, the human ways, the way you pour into our people, into our youth over these years. And I'm literally honored to have you on. You. And th this sister Janelle, I, you're literally a treasure and i'm happy to be part of your legacy and be able to share your gifts with the world um you know I, you love us as a people and you love our culture that we create and it's it just shows in everything that you do and how you do what you do and so i just want to say before we get go any further thank you for all that you've done so far and best to you as you continue to grow and pursue your phd so thanks again to both of you uh being on the thank show you, Ricky. and congratulations to you for winning the uh, best black podcast of 2022 brother that's pretty hey. major you've been on that long so i salute you for all the work that you've done in, in, in such a short amount of time with this beautiful podcast I appreciate you, brother. Uh, small correction. I got nominated for Best Black Podcast oh, of the Year. Nominated. But even that, was, I mean, we were like maybe six months in when we got nominated. So I take that as a victory that yes, people you know, noticed and, and it's impacting people. So I really, I, I do appreciate it. Um, but, you know, it doesn't happen without people like yourself showing up and giving of your time. And I don't typically tell the audience this, but just today, so you guys know, it's a hot Saturday afternoon in New York and they are spending an hour with me. Uh, for you guys. So just know that these people are literally giving of their space and themselves and their time. So I just want to thank you guys both. Um, you know, I typically like to start these conversations with a little bit of background about the guests. Uh, but in this conversation, I really want to spend as much time as we can talking about the show and some higher level concepts and things that I know we're going to dig deep into. So I'm going to task the audience with doing a little bit of research on their own into your respective background. But that being said, Jamel, your story is well known in some circles, but I believe underappreciated and, and under uh, knowledged in others. So could you just, you know, briefly, man, touch on some key moments in your journey from a young man who grew up in, in New York and picked up a camera at 15 years old to your time in the military and, and that path to becoming a, a renowned and groundbreaking photographer. Yes, th thank you for the introduction. Uh, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York in 1960. You know, my father was a professional photographer. He learned at the age of 17 years old when he enlisted in the military. Uh, I grew up in a community in Red Hook in South Brooklyn. It was a, a community of, of, of a lot of Southerners that had migrated from the South to the North during the 1930s and 40s. Um, and I grew up in a photography family, you know, practically all of my uncles were photographers. They were all veterans. And it seemed like at that time when you served, the camera was something that you took with you to document your journey. S similar to how the iPhone is today for veterans, having the camera is very important. So I grew up in an environment that was always photographs around, even the family history. Those albums were very important that were passed on from generation to generation. So early on as a young child, I saw the value of not only photographs, but the fact that we have to preserve our history and culture. So that was embedded in my mind at a real, really early age. It wasn't until I was 15 years old that, let me before I, I have to rewind a little bit, it was a book that changed my life uh, when I was about nine years old. My father had a signed copy of a book by a photographer by the name of Leonard Freed on our coffee table. And, you know, he had a vast library, but whatever reason, this book was on the coffee, ta coffee table and was signed. And I picked that book up. It's called Black and White America. It seemed like that book was tailor-made for me to serve as a roadmap to the journey in which I was going to embark on in my life in later years. So before I physically picked up a camera, I read this book. I read the entire book. I went through, went through every photograph. It's through this, this one book I was able to see outside of my Brooklyn community and see Harlem for the very first time, to see the segregated South. 
I vividly remember reading and having a dictionary and my notepad with me because I was being introduced to words that I wasn't familiar with in school, like racism, discrimination, lynching, uh, 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 and words of that nature. So it's through this one book that will change in my life. And then years later, when I turned 15 years old, uh, inspired by a gang leader in my community, when I went to his home with my friend, I saw his photo albums of his gang from the 70s. And this wasn't your, your gang, the, the gangs that we typically think of with cut off jean jackets, you know, and, and jeans on. These were gangs were a combination of Caribbeans and African-Americans called the Jolly Stompers. And within these incredible photographs of these rude boys, I saw the power of, of photography document my, my peers. You know, we're looking at my father's photographs. I saw uh, his generation and Leonard Fries images. I saw protest, protest images. But when I saw these particular photographs that were taken in my Brooklyn community, I said right then and there, I want to be a photographer. So I immediately went home, snatched, snatched up my, my mother's one tin camera that she always had around. And I went back to my junior high school and I started photographing my peers. But what's so amazing about that journey is that when I look through the viewfinder, it's like it opened up my third eye to a whole nother world that I didn't even know existed. I was able to see beauty within people. I was able to see humanity. And at that point, I realized I have a purpose in life. So that one camera became not only a time machine, but it became a compass that would now put me on a very unique path that I needed to be on. This is around the time that a lot of my partners were graffiti artists. And I tried that. It didn't really work for me. But it was something about photography approaching people, engaging them, telling them that I see their beauty, having these conversations, believing that everybody I met on this path to life, I met for a reason. And now the, the camera became this time machine and allowed me to freeze, it, mo this, freeze this moment in time and gain friendships. So at 15, I started making my first set of images. Uh, my parents divorced when I was uh, 16 years old. And then I went astray and I had to, to leave the camera alone. And I decided in order to survive, let me enlist in the military, you know? So I decided at 16 years old that I got to get away with my partner who was going through a similar situation as myself. We enlisted in the army on our 17 birthdays, we were prepared to go. And for the next three years, you know, I, I, I went to infantry school. And after that I was stationed in Germany, which is a great experience for me because it allowed me to get away and see a whole nother world that helped me develop. And meanwhile, back in America, you know, my generation was hit hard with both the heroin epidemic, a PCP and drugs in general, and I lost a lot of my peers. So the military saved me and allowed me to get away. And I used that experience as an opportunity to really, you know, gain my education and realize that this is a path that I needed to be on to develop myself. While stationed over there, I stayed in school. I stayed in the library to educate myself so I could come home a better person. It was in Germany that I was introduced to the Black Arts Movement through, through literature. And I vowed that when I returned back to the States, I'm going to be a light a source of inspiration. Because while I was in Germany, I was getting word that some of my friends' little brothers would have gotten murdered in the street. So I wanted to know what was going on. So when I came home during the summer of 1980, I came home on a mission to be a light. And the camera became the compass that allowed me to reconnect with people. So through the language of photography, I was able to kind of like, uh, and I look at it, I often reference Marvin Gaye's song, What's Happening, Brother? That song represents me coming back to the world after being in the military, and I needed to know what was going on. And what they were telling me, there was a war going on where young men that were once friends were at, each, uh, at, 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 each, at odds with each other, hurting and, 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 and killing each other. And I want to be a light now. And I realized that the camera was my compass and, and the knowledge I gained through my experience in Germany gave me the voice to engage young people. So I went on a mission to, to create these images. People see the photographs and the poses, but what they don't really understand is that I was using photography as a language to connect with people and let them know that I recognized their genius. And I was building bridges at the same time by taking a photograph. You will, will, I would engage you in conversation first, tell you that I was stationed overseas. I'm here to try to be a big brother. And, uh, and then, then I would photograph them and give them a photograph to which to build friendship. And the photograph itself became evidence of the conversation. That wasn't really about being a photographer at that point. All I wanted to really be was a light. I was inspired greatly by the autobiography of Malcolm X, and I was moved how he went back to the community, engaged the pimps, the prostitutes, and, and the people that we would normally walk by. I wanted to mirror that. So that's the early start of my development. And it's so much more. This is so extensive. I don't want to really take up too much time, but that's the foundation. But again, the camera was that compass that would lead me on these different assignments. Because at an early age, I realized that this is my assignment right now. 
I need to travel and connect with people to find out what's going on and at the same time impart knowledge to them in hopes of saving our people. Because unbeknownst to me at the time, something bad was going on. We didn't quite know what it was at that time, but the AIDS epidemic was on the horizon when I first came home. And then just a few years later, the crack epidemic hit. So I realized now that I'm on a mission to use photography as a form of visual ministry to try to enlighten as many people as I can. Like I said, the photograph was secondary. That was just evidence of the conversation. What was more important to me was to get into the souls of these young brothers because so many were at odds with each other. When I look at my books, I could look at pictures of individuals that really hated each other. But meanwhile, they dressed the same. They looked like they could be best friends. But when that crack came, it made enemies of friends. And, and that's what my work is really about. And I just wanted to be a light and the camera was, you know, photography was the platform that I happened to use to reach people. You know, first of all, <laughs> I'm just going to warn the audience that I'm going to be emotional through half this conversation because this is a very emotional conversation for many reasons. First of all, I remember living through all the things that you talked about. I'm a few years younger than you, but I'm old enough to remember these things. And I, first of all, thank you for being obedient, right? So first of all, you were obedient to a call to ministry that you may not recognize as a call to ministry at the time, but you were absolutely obedient to that. I love the fact that you used visual ministry because that's what it is. You were called to use your gifts to serve other people and you willingly leaned into that and not just kind of did it, but you leaned into it fully. And I think we should all owe you a debt of gratitude for doing that because God knows how many countless lives that you saved by doing that. Um, the other thing, brother, I just want to remark on is, you know, there's this notion in the world that, you know, school isn't for everybody, right? Higher education, college is not for everybody. And that's true. It's not necessarily for everybody. But in order to do anything well, you do have to have some sort of education, whether you're educating yourself, whether you're being mentored by somebody, you've got to lean in and be educated. And before you pick up a camera, you spent all that time learning the power of images, learning your craft, taking notes, learning new words and terms. And I just wanted to reinforce that for people because, you know, we live in this Instagram age. Everybody sees a picture. They think they can do the thing. Uh, a lot of my young friends, and I'm, I'm really close to a lot of young people, and so I'm not going to sit here and diss a generation. But, you know, there's this thing about not wanting to pay dues, not wanting to learn lessons. But you've got to learn the fundamentals of anything you want to do before you can really engage in it in an impactful way. And so, you know, you're just a really strong example of that. You didn't look down upon, on other people for what you learned and what you knew, but you used it to serve other people. But you couldn't do that if you hadn't leaned into learning yeah. about it and educating yourself. So I just wanted to call that out because that's really amazing and it's inspiring oh. and it's still impactful to this day. Janelle, what about you? Talk to me a little bit about your journey. Where are you from and, and what led you to the art world and, and your current roles as a PhD con, um, candidate, a culture producer and, and a curator? Because I know a little bit about your journey, but I want the audience to hear more about who you are and how you got here. Yeah, so I um, am originally from White Plains, New York. And I would say that um, I had a love of art from a very young age. My mother likes to say that she doesn't know where I came from, even though I came from her. Uh, because no one in my family has any inclination towards art whatsoever. Mm. Um, my mother's a nurse. Uh, my sister's a nurse. Mm. Um, one of my other sisters, she um, is in the wellness industry. And my father, um, again, um, did not work in any capacity having to do with the arts. And so when my mother says, where did you come from? Because they just, they just couldn't understand how I took up this love in this way. And I think it's really honestly only now um, that my family is really coming to understand the value of my work, um, which is service, which is service, right? Mm -hmm. So um, in my capacity as a cultural producer, in my capacity as a curator, in my capacity as an educator, um, I see that as service, mm -hmm. whether I'm in service to my students whether I'm in service to a phenomenal artist like Jamel Shabazz, whether I'm in service to, um, at this moment, um, the Austin community by bringing his work to this community to elevate a conversation that, of course, encompasses the greatness of his work, but also elevates the community that it's in just to have deeper conversations about where we are as a people um, what we can do as a people, right? And so 
um, in this instance, um, with this particular project, aside from the many other things I do, because I have all the slash, slash, slashes, <laughs> um, this project very much um, is in service in that way. And so I'm here at this moment, very grateful, um, feeling very blessed and very determined actually to keep doing the good work, to keep pressing on, to keep um, elevating community and to keep elevating myself, of course, you know, um, in the capacity where I am in service and I am, um, you know, hopefully making my family proud, uh, making those who appreciate the work that I do proud and um, just just very grateful, very grateful. Well, well said, sister. You know, the other thing too, Janelle, I think it's fair and I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts about this are, but not only you're in service, but one could argue, and I think convincingly, that because of the kind of work you do and because of the power of art, you are indeed a healer as well. You're mm -hmm. using creativity to heal people. It mm -hmm. heals us as a people to mm -hmm. see life-giving images of ourselves. It heals us as a That's people right. to reimagine uh, a well-known artist that people really misunderstood, uh, like Basquiat. It heals us as a people to have our stories told through our gaze and not others' gaze. So in many ways, you are absolutely a member of your family. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely in sync with them because you are a healer. You're just using a different mm -hmm. set of skills to heal, but you're I absolutely a healer. I love you. Thank, uh, thank you. Thank you for offering that. Yeah, no, you're very welcome. You know, I met Janelle, the uh, audience, full disclosure. I met her in 2016 when I was attending this amazing Basquiat Still Fly 55 uh, symposium uh, that she did at NYU uh, with her uh, colleague. And I'm still grateful, Janelle, for the work you did on that event because I'm a huge Basquiat fan and been for a very long time. But at the time, I felt he hadn't received his due in general. And I thought in many ways, and this is going to sound surprising and might even be controversial to people, but I didn't think he really received his due with us as a people. I think he was underrepresented. I think people didn't really talk about him. And, you know, many of the uh, established folks kind of almost, it almost felt like they didn't want to mention him because they didn't want to be compared to, I don't know, it was just this weird undercurrent that I always thought existed about Basquiat and his work before you did this work. Uh, and, you know, I don't know if you were single-handedly responded to it or you and your partner were responsible for it, but I felt like the narrative kind of shifted after that. And this wonderful exhibit that his family's putting on right now. Have you guys, either one of you been able to see that show? And, and, no. and what do you think about the impact of your work uh, uh, on Basquiat's legacy and what you do as poor living and how that really kind of helps us uh, reframe uh, some of the things that we thought we knew in the past and how we feel about them and our artists to this day? Yeah, I think it was a big moment. Um, it was a big moment for New York in thinking about his legacy. It was the first time, at least to my knowledge, that um, a collective of scholars, cultural critics, and artists um, of color, black and brown people, primarily were talking about his work, right? And so that was a really beautiful moment. And um, it, it flew a little bit under the radar at the time, but it was very impactful um, nonetheless. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm very thankful for people that remember that moment and what it did um, to, again, elevate the conversation um, of this particular artist. And so even with my uh, work with Jamel now, I see this as a continuum. You know, I see this is, you know, part of the work that I'm called to do um, when working with artists, um, presenting, you know, humbly a new view, hopefully, of the artist, um, an elevation of that artist's conversation, their work, um, definitely um, paying honor and homage to the artist's work. And so with, of course, that Basquiat Symposium, which yeah, it really was a big moment um, in thinking about his legacy. And I, I definitely see, you know, the work that I've done with Jamel as a continuation of that work. Amazing. Now, I want to hear more about how you two came together. I understand that you were introduced by one of my favorite people in the world. Uh, and uh, I just want to understand how you, how you met and, and how this became such a wonderful and loving professional as well as personal relationship between friends. 
Or you the one who can start. I'll, I'll let Janelle start that one. I like I like that story. Well, I'm gonna let you. I was gonna let you start it. <laughs> Ladies first. <laughs> oh, you see how you see how you do me, Ricky. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So yeah, you know we Jamel and I were introduced at the Studio Museum of Harlem by Dr. Deborah Willis. You know, a titan. Absolutely. Titan. Period. You could just say that, right? And so um, I remember her human being too, you know, yeah. I mean? like she's accomplished and she's achieved much. Yeah. But she at her core is just a wonderful human being. That's Absolutely. Right. But I really, I really like to say the word I'm on this, this, I'm on this, 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 this uh, word Titan this week. Mm-hmm. That's where I am. And I feel like I say that in conjunction with her, obviously everyone here know why, knows why that applies to Dr. Deborah Willis. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that when we think about women and their contributions and their work, we don't normally think of that word, right? Perhaps. And it's very fitting. Um, so I want to, I want to honor her and the work that she's done by placing her word in her, her, her work in, in connection with a word like that, because mm-hmm. it is very fitting. Um, and I remember she said to me, um, at the time I was a coordinator of the Expanding the Walls program at the Studio Museum of Harlem, which is a photography-based program that centers primarily on the work of James Vanderzee, but it's a community photography-based program that services teens from all of the five boroughs um, and even some of the outer boroughs. And we were at this event And I didn't know, I was a fan of Jamel's work already, but I didn't know this is who I was seeing. And so Deb comes to me and she's just like, "Um, this is somebody you should meet. This is somebody that you should invite to talk to your kids. Mm. And I'm like, okay, yes, (laughs) ma'am. And we made it happen, right? And so um, that was really wonderful. And Jamel came he spoke to the kids at the time I had a, a class of all girls just right up my alley for the Spelman woman I am. <laughs> I did not know and, you were the Spelman woman. That oh, makes sense. Listen, let me tell you. All day long, twice on Saturdays. Okay. <laughs> and, um, you know, Jamel, I remember when Jamel came, man, those girls just ate him up. I mean, they just loved him, loved him. Oh my goodness. I mean, I think for weeks, I was like, all right. <laughs> I love this man. And, um, and it was just so, he was so generous and so kind. Just so he was so generous and so kind and so supportive. You know, sometimes when you meet people at a particular moment in your life, because at that moment, I was really like, not in a good place. You know, we go, this is life. So we go through these ups and downs, right? And so that particular moment, I just, I really wasn't in a good place. I was just very um, discouraged. I didn't feel like I was really getting this, you know, art world thing. I didn't think that I could really enter it in any significant way. And Jamel said to me something to the effect um, when when he was leaving, like, you know, Janelle, you're going to do very well. And you have my full support. Simple words, kind words, very impactful. Never forgot them, right? You know, a lot of times when we speak to people and we say things, you really don't know the impact those kind words can have on somebody. Because, yeah, because I needed those words at that moment. I really did. And it took a long time it absolutely did for certain things to manifest. I'm living in, you know, the manifestation of those words right now, but it took a long time. But those words at that moment meant everything to me. And I think, you know, over the years, as I've continued to know Jamel, you know, one of the things I really respect is the ways in which he has worked with young people. Um formerly how he would go into the parks and, you know, encourage and talk to young people. And so it was very natural for us to, um, over time, have a sort of kinship 
and talk. And that's why I kept talking to him, kept talking to him, kept talking to him and um, knew that I wanted to work with him, curate a show for him, but didn't necessarily know what that would look like, you know? So we're here now and it's been a blessed journey. And Janelle and, and Deborah Willis have been two really wonderful angels in my life that I met over time that really helped me to navigate through this very complicated journey, you know, because I stepped into it not really knowing what I was doing. You know, it was, it was all based off a passion to share the work to a larger audience. I had met Deborah Willis back in, in the early 2000s, you know, at a Black Film Festival down in Mexico. And uh, I've always heard that she's somebody that you really need to connect with. And she was just that angel that didn't know me and she embraced me and she gave me her business card and told me to stay in contact. And she's been there to kind of like guide me from that point. I was researching her and looking at everything that she did as a, a as an author, as a curator. And, and she kind of like paved the way for me, you know, so she was always trying to connect me, connect me with people. So to hear the story of how Deborah Willis told Janelle to connect with me is, is, is profound because it's like Janelle is somebody I needed to meet on this path of life because I was trying to figure it all out. Like I said, I didn't, I, I knew how to do the books. You know, I was given the opportunity to do exhibitions all over the world, but I didn't really feel good with that. I wanted to come back to the community and speak to the children. So when Janelle reached out to me with the Expanding the Walls project, just that name alone blew me away, Expanding the Walls and how we could take photography and the arts and use it as this global language to connect with the world using young people as that catalyst. I immediately accepted it. And it kind of like put me on this path of moving forward in this particular area because what I let everyone know who I do business with, whether it's an exhibition or it's a workshop, I have to connect with young people. This is what this work is all about, creating a path for them, trying to be a torchlight for this next generation. So Janelle provided me with that opportunity. It gave me confidence. I wasn't teaching before. It's very important to note, you know, I spent 20 years working as a New York City correction officer, doing some very harsh conditions, seeing the destruction of our people, seeing the impact that crack has had and, and forced to care and all of that. So now being placed in a position to work with young people, and at that time, particularly girls, it was a blessing because I believe that my compass, my camera, led me on a path to meet these young visionaries. And I believe that we all met for a reason in life and let me use this opportunity to empower them with whatever I have to help them grow and develop in this craft, using again the language of photography. And with Janelle, yes, everyone I meet on this journey, I pledge my support because I felt that we met here for a reason and I continue to understand why we met. And we've been building ever since. I think it's been well over 15 years since that first encounter and look at what we have done now. So when I meet young people who have ambitions, if I have resources I can lend to help them fulfill those endeavors, I'm always here. And this is a testimony that we made that happen because she shared with me early on that she had aspirations to do an exhibition on women. And, and, and it took time, but it happened and happened at the right time because with COVID and everything going on, uh, this exhibition piece of the queen serves as a healing place where people can go and get their spirits reinvigorated to give them a sense of hope and possibility. So the timing was really right that the exhibition would kick off this year during this critical time. So I'm very thankful for Janelle and Deborah Willis in my life. Again, two wonderful angels that helped me kind of like figure things out. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and you guys are inspiring on many levels because you know, everybody talks about networking, right? And but what networking means to most people is how can I make the net work for me? Mm. Uh, and you guys are the opposite, right? You're invested in service. You're invested in doing what I think spiritually is what we're supposed to do, which is acknowledge the fact that we all come to this life with gifts, but our gifts are not meant for us. They're meant to come through us That's and right. be used in service of other people. We talk about community, but community means pouring into the community as much as you're taking out of community. We talk about Black Lives Matter. They do, but they also matter, and you can show they matter by how you're showing up for other people, how you're showing up for community, how you're showing up for young people, how you're showing up for seniors, how we show up for each other is the grandest statement we can make about what community and what our people really mean to us. You can't tell me how much people mean to us if you're worried about being the center of attention all the time and you're not going to use your gifts to pour into other people and make the world a better place. And each of you, I mean, every single one of you guys uh, do that. And Deb Willis, I have my own story that I won't get into in deep detail, but I was in a, my first group show in New York of paintings I did at our Rush Arts Gallery, remember Rush Arts? Uh, mm. 
And and she was there and she didn't know me from anybody else. And she was like, young man, I really like your work and stay on your journey, this, that, and the third. She probably didn't re remember having this conversation with me, but what that meant for me at the beginning of my career, I cannot tell you how important that encouragement from somebody who I'd already done some research on and knew about, how mm. important that is. You don't know how you affect other people, but trust me, you're always affecting other people, negatively or positively, but you have an effect on everybody that you lead. And then I think we have to really take seriously the you know, responsibility to lean into that and be mindful of what we're saying, what we're doing, and who we're being as we interact with others, particularly with our young people. Uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, you guys also have something else that kind of ties you together, which is having lost family members to, to violence, right? And mm -hmm. I don't want to get into the trauma of it all, but I want to touch on that because that leads into what we're really here to talk about, which is the show, the ret retrospective piece to the queen and, and how that tie is present in the show, but how you don't focus on that. Um, you know, I, I, I've read so much about the show. Unfortunately, it's in Austin, and I don't know that I'm going to get to Austin before uh, the show ends, but I think anybody who has an opportunity to get there should be able to get down there and see it. It's an important show. It's an impactful show. The images I've seen are as powerful as any of your images I've ever seen, Jamel. But tell me a little bit about how you guys came to understand that connection of losing family members to, to, uh, to violence and, and how that's impacted your careers uh, as professionals and how it's impacted your bond that you guys built together as well. Yeah. I'll let you know take that because the show is yeah. really different with her sister Karen. Yeah. I think it goes back to that moment of when Jamel and I first met. I don't know if he remembers this, but we had some we had a pretty intense conversation when we first met. And um we I shared about my sister's death with him, but he also shared um something with me that um was very personal. And um, I realized over time with the show, there was one moment I was at a museum and um, the lecturer, he was talking about how this painter had helped him cope with the death of his mother. And in that moment, I don't know why, it was just something about those words and then actually the image he was showing and it's like a light bulb went off for me. And I was just like, that's why um, I love Jamel's images so much. Like I remember literally thinking that. And I'm like, that's why, because it reminds me of Karen and it reminds me of like her friends, like that's why. Like I knew I liked his work because before I met Jamel, I was a fan. I was a fan of his work, right? And then I got to know him personally. And that moment being in that lecture, I was like, oh, that's it. That's it. That's it. You know, that's why when I see his images, they are impacting me so much. I feel something, right? And I feel like my story about like feeling something when I see Jamel's images is not uncommon to any of his other fans. Um, I feel like people have a strong connection to Jamel's work, obviously for a reason, mm -hmm. but there's something there that elicits this type of nostalgia. Um, it connects them to a particular moment in time. It connects them to their family members. Mm -hmm. It connects, connects them to, you know, their childhood, their, their coming of age, right? And so um, I think that is definitely the definitive moment for me and how, like, at least the genesis of the story and this exhibition manifested the way it did. Um, just thinking about how his imagery and the preciseness with the way that he captured the image, his imagery, but also, you know, we talked about, um, he talked about being a light, right? Um, he talked about, um, this, this idea of visual medicine, he talks about a lot. Right. And so it was all those things for me, like his, the work was a light for me. The work was, I, I couldn't identify it or language it as visual medicine, but that's what it was doing for me because I didn't have the language for it. It was just like, it was something there. I just knew that I was connecting to the work and there was a strong reason why I was connecting to the work. And there are deeper things um, 
in terms for me, at least in terms of like thinking about Jamel's work. I mean, we can go to to a multitude of things. I mean, because it's just the work is is so powerful. The work has so much to offer us, right? Ricky, you know this, right? Yeah. Um, we think about the different eras through which Jamel was um, photographing, you know, the crack epidemic, the AIDS epidemic, uh, Reaganomics even, right? I mean, you could, you could just stop with one and be like, there's so much. But I mean, this is over the man, just, you know, bars, 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 right? <laughs> you know, so it's like, you know, the work, it really, it really has something to offer us right now in the future. I think I told him when we were working on the show, is like, I was like, Jamal, I think that you literally are only like just at the tip of the iceberg of where your work can go. Like, that's how I really felt. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I made certain choices when doing this exhibition, because I felt like I was, I was really examining the work. Like, yes, I was connecting to my sister's story um, um, about her passing, but also um, honoring her life and honoring her, the, her friends and their lives. But I was really like dissecting and examining Jamel's work to see like within that story, how can I also elevate the work and show the work in such a way that it even surprises his, you know, core audience. Mm -hmm. That's what I was really going for. I really wanted to turn things on its head, uh, which is why I presented a particular promo image the way that I did, because it was a studio shot. And a lot of images that we see of Jamel's work are out on the street, but I wanted to turn that on its head. I wanted to present um, some of his fashion forward images because I love them. Like I was, I was just like, I love, I love this work, you know. Yeah, um, I was so excited by it, and I'm like, I'm gonna show this work, you know. Like, I think this looks hot, you know. And so I wanted to show that work. I wanted to show the port. I wanted to show the work that he was known for. That you know his his fans know and love, but I really wanted to push things as far as I possibly could go. Not only with the presentation of his images, you know, as a curator selecting them, but also the presentation of the show itself. The show is very artistic. I don't think that Jamel's work has been shown in this way in any other context. It's a very artistic, beautifully crafted show. I put all the love and respect that I have for his work all the love and respect I have for my sister into this show that I could I could possibly do. And the show is a reflection of that, I, I do believe. And that's why you know, it, it works. That's why it works. I'm sorry, Jamal. But that's why it works because you guys both are moving through this world, moving through your process, moving through your creativity, being authentically who you are. And in being who you are, you can bring out pieces of each other that each other may not have even seen when you were putting in it. You know, yes. people do things for the accolades now. They do things for the checks and what all those things are important. I get it. But being who you were made to be and being as full in that, as, as strong and as resolute in that is possible. And it's not only possible, but it's necessary because that, again, brings your gifts to the fore, puts you in a position where you do what you're here to do. And you'll never know the depths of the treasure that's founded mm -hmm. in that if you don't lean into that authenticity, the absolute authenticity in which uh, Jamel creates work will make it the kind of work that you'll unearth new things about 50, 100 years from now. And Jamel is a curator, as a cultural producer, your authenticity in the way you tell stories, why you're telling the stories, the love that goes into the stories will lead you to unearth things that other curators will never see because you're being who you were mm -hmm. made to be. And that's so important. I just wanted to call that out because I think it's so important, you guys. It's just, yes, you have talent, you have skills, but you're being who you are at the core. And that's where success comes from. That's where joy comes from. That's where life comes from. You're being who God made you to be. You can't fail when you're doing that. And God put us on this path together to create this collaboration. Again, 
during this very critical time in, in the history, not only America, but the world. And to create these spaces where people can come together and look at each other in a, in a human way. Because with art, again, being that global language, there's a wide range of people that are coming to see the, the exhibition. And like uh, I often speak about the role that uh, W.E. Du Bose had with the Negro exhibition in 1900, the idea of using images to help to break down stereotypes. So for me, you know, the foundation of my work is joy and love. It's necessary to, 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 to create images like that to serve as a counterbalance to a lot of the negativity in which we are seeing today. And it's been turned up like never before. And Janelle knows my pain and my passion when it comes down to this right here. I feel that as a, a, a servant of God, that I have a divine responsibility to, to, to use this divine gift of vision to bring some healing in the world by showcasing the joy and the beauty, the love and the family. So I never quite really understood why I would meet the people I met on this path to life. I would often tell them that it may not make sense now, but it's going to make sense later. And now this year, really when 2019 hit the pandemic, a lot of people went into a deep depression. And that's why I, I took a moment of pause. I talked to God to reexamine my path and what it is I need to do. I studied alchemy. I looked at the book of Eli featuring Denzel Washington. I realized my path now is to be that recorder of history and culture to preserve this incredible archive and bring it out now as a form of visual medicine on my various social media feeds where people can now heal. We speak about the physical vaccination. I have the visual vaccination. I wake up every morning with a desire to put something on social media that could put joy in a person's heart. And people write me and said, Jamel, this photograph made my heart smile. That makes me feel like I made a difference. You know, so I have this great platform of Instagram and Facebook to use and to take a moment of thought, what can I put on there today that could make a person smile, brings joy in life? And it's all the images in which I've documented, but the, the majority of them do represent joy and, and, and family. There is the pain and sorrow. This is relevant as well, but I have to put the joy out there right now. And when we speak about death, it's, it, it's really the foundation of my work as well, because what's blowing me away is these thousands of people I met throughout my journey. And now through social media, I'm posting these pictures only to find out that they're not here. And it's really interesting on, 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 on a number of levels, because there's young, like there's two young brothers that I reconnect with who fathers are two of the most iconic photographs in my book. Rude Boy is one. And then there's my partner, Brian Davis, and Rude Boy was murdered, and his son never met his father because he was in his mother's womb. So I was able to connect with him on social media, give him a copy of his father's picture, and tell him what his father meant to me, and it's helping him with his healing process. Another young brother reached out to me due to Instagram. I had a photograph of his father who died around the same time, around the same age. And what I'm doing now, I'm giving these young children photographs of their loved ones who are no longer here. And it's helping them with the healing process. And the stories are endless. I posted a photograph a few months ago of this beautiful sister with her husband, a young baby, and just posted on Instagram because it was a, a picture of family. And then the husband reached out to me and said, that's my wife who died two years ago. And I and he just told me what this image meant to him. He had no memory of it whatsoever. So I look at it as, as contributing to the healing right now. And at the same time, family and loved ones now have photographed of, of, of their members who are no longer here. And that makes me feel good because I receive letters every week involving people saying, you have a picture of my mother. My father's no longer here. He just died. And since COVID hit, I've lost over 80 people. And out of the 80 that I've lost, I have photographs of every single one. And in, in many cases, the family doesn't have them. Sadly, my images are being used on obituaries, you know, or, or, or announcements as a person has passed away. So it's all coming full circle to me right now. And I'm just trying to, again, just fulfill my assignment, which is to be a light in this world and help break down these stereotypes. I would imagine that I have a base with over 140,000 people from around the world that embrace my work. I get letters from Alaska, Australia, Belgium, Italy, people telling me that they have an appreciation for the work in which I created. So it makes me feel good that I could, as an artist, you know, bring some type of joy into this world here because it's really through the arts that we can make this world a better place. I always say that a lot of the politicians and religious leaders have failed, 
but it's coming upon the artist. As Harry Belafonte always says, we are the gatekeepers and we have a responsibility, whether you be a, a, a photographer, a filmmaker, let us use this divine gift to bring joy in this world. And I'm, I'm just grateful I found, found my call. It took me a while to really understand it, but now at the stage in my life and with everything going on and all the loss, it has never been clearer to me that this is the assignment that I've been given in life. You know, and my, my goal right now, like the Book of Eli, is to make sure that all this history I've recorded over the past 45 years is preserved in institutions of higher learning and museums for the future generation. It's bigger than me. It's just me striving to make, to make sure that our history and culture is preserved. Because one of the things since COVID has hit and, and through the hard economic times, a lot of people are losing their family albums. Stuff is going into storage shelters, is being lost because people can't afford it. And the history and culture is being lost. So I'm just grateful that I've been given this assignment to preserve a little bit of the history going back into the 70s, the 80s and 90s. I'm grateful that that camera was given to me. And in my little way, I'm just one of many because there's so many others that are doing it. But I'm just grateful that this particular assignment has been given to me. And now I have that outlet in exhibitions where I can make sure that the work is preserved. Well said, brother. And again, I can think I can speak for a lot of people that we are grateful that you, have, both of you, have leaned into your gifts and you take them seriously and you're taking the responsibility seriously because it's so needed uh, in this world. Uh, continuing on that thought, though, I, I want to take a moment. I'm going to read something that I wrote down because I wanted to make sure I asked this question properly. You know, I want to take a moment to unpack two really important elements in this show, trauma and memories. Uh, and in these times where our social media feeds and, and the news cycle is a constant tr stream of what I call trauma porn, uh, I love, mm -hmm. love, love the fact that Peace to the Queen isn't about trauma, but, and this is a quote, it isn't about trauma, but it's about transforming trauma, transforming mm -hmm. memories into something uplifting and something healing. It's about evoking the positive elements of nostalgia, which of course is very much in line with your work, Jamel, uh, and your ethos around photography and your desire to never want to be without memories. I wanna talk mm. about that a little bit deeper. Is this something consciously that the two of you uh, came to or is this just kind of organically emerged because you both share a similar worldview in the way that you like to work and, and the way, what things you wanna put into the world? For me, memory is everything. You know, I have an aunt now who is suffering from Alzheimer's and just to see her, just once vibrant woman, you know, in this state of, of, of unawareness has been very troubling. And I just thought about my own personal life and I never want to be without memory. You know, so when I embarked on this journey, especially when I was stationed overseas, I was very clear on the power of memory. You know, I've held on to all of my photographs. I've ever, every, every letter that's ever been written to me, a lot of the people who've written me are no longer here. So I'm about treasuring it. I don't, you know, so it means a lot to me. And I wanted a visual diary of my journey to show that, you know, even to show my family that this is the journey I've been on. These are the people and situations I've encountered throughout my life, and especially for my daughter. So I want you to have this here because through my lens, you can get a greater insight on what your father has experienced. Just like what my father left for me. He's been gone for many years now, but through his negative and negatives and writings and the books that he's read and television programs that he watched, he's able to live with inside me. So I wanted to secure a legacy for other generations. So it was very clear on my mind and it's helped me with my trauma too. And to be honest with you, it's still very traumatizing mm -hmm. more now than ever before because through my posts to see before in, in, in the nineties and early two thousands, there was no platform to share the work now. Now I'm sharing the work. And now the image is coming alive. I like to refer to my work as frozen moments in time. But when I release them to social media, they are thawed out. And now they give another life of their own. And now through sharing these images, I'm finding out that people are photographed have died. And it's like, it's amazing me. So now that's somewhat of the trauma to know. Because when I look at my images, they, the, my subjects are all looking at me. You know, So I'm able to see my reflection in their eyes. And it becomes very painful to know that a lot of them died really in, in, in bad ways. And I have that very last memory of them. So that trauma comes back again. You know, when I revisit photographs, even now in having a lot of telephone conversations with a number of people I grew up with, even people I'm meeting on social media, they are sharing with me, they might have even murdered the people I photographed. And now for them, it's a sense of atonement to say, let me tell you how he died. I was there that night that he died. Let me tell you about these wars that we had. 
all of these stories are coming out now because of this moment that I froze that I didn't quite know why I met this person on this path at this particular moment to take this image, to freeze this moment in time, throw it out 40 years later, only to find out the, the other narrative to why this happened. And that's incredible to me right now. And these stories are like, they are traumatizing. And it pains my heart because there's moments I felt like I failed, like, wow, you know, I know I knew both you brothers and I was trying to help y'all at the same time. At all of this grief, and now this brother's gone. So my work does form a serve as a form of healing for the person that might have took another man's life. In retrospect, you look at that picture and you remind, and that was one of the reasons why I did my book back in the days, not for fame and fortune, but at that time I was working in the jail, and I had already met a young brother who was under me all the time, and I was trying to give him guidance. Said, this is a good brother right here. Let me give him as much guidance as I can because he's caught up in an unfortunate situation. Photographs and share them with him every day and break down the history of the photographs. I remember telling him one day, I said, Yeah, this is my partner right here that got murdered. He was a good brother. He was a photographer. They murdered him at the fever for no reason. You know, and I don't understand why they would take this brother's life. Only to find out that the brother I was talking to, I was a this was the one that murdered him. And I had a, and I let him go. I let him go. And then sadly, with something that haunts me to this day. And let, it's like it's like being on a lifeboat, a raft, and this brother is swimming towards you. And you got your hand, you bring them in, and you're bringing them in, and you make eye contact. You turn out something about him and you let him go. And then they end up murdering him. And that's something that pains me because I needed to know why. Why is this going on? So in bringing my photographs to the jail, there's a lot of things that's happening that I will find out later on. That certain individuals were incarcerated because they murdered somebody I knew personally. And I was able to interact with both. You know, I could hang out with this brother, the enemy, and the friend, and only realize that over nonsense they were killing each other. So I say all that to say there's so much I work anybody could imagine. When I do exhibitions, especially in foreign countries, I break down and cry. Because here I got this work on the walls. People look at the sky and posing. But you don't realize I'm looking at the soul. And again, when I look at the eyes, the person's looking directly at me. It's an exchange between me and that person. And that person is physically not here. And he's not here because of some nonsense. And this is what I'm saying. So that's, that's the trauma that comes for me personally. But at the same time, it's helping me heal. And with those who've now matured, they're able to atone and realize that it really wasn't worth it, especially those that were incarcerated and end up doing 30 years. I used to always tell a lot of brothers on the street, the way this thing is going down, you murdered this brother. He's dead. His family's suffering. You're doing 25 to life. Your family's suffering. At the end of the day, nobody wins. So we got to end this nonsense. So that's what it was all about with me, using photography to have conversations, you know, and try to help with this healing process. And, you know, what about you? Was it a conscious decision to, yes, it was informed by trauma, but you really didn't put trauma front and center, as so often happens in so much of, you know, our culture currently? I think it was a process because there was the revelation of what the show was going to be, what the show was going to be about. And then there was the process of actually making the show happen. Right. So I'm thinking about my sister, Karen, but I'm celebrating her life. Um, I'm celebrating her life. I'm celebrating the life of her friends looking back upon this very pivotal moment in my family's life where my sister's life was taken from her fiance. And so when I say the show is very much about transforming trauma, it's me not only processing that moment, it's also me processing the moment that I was going through in order to make the show become a reality because I was also going through some very serious things trying to uh, make this show happen, right? And so I think when you're going through, um, you know, you need people, um, but sometimes people aren't there, right? So what do you do when people aren't there? And there comes a time when we all have to realize sometimes, you know, you are really the only one responsible for your healing, right? And so 
there was that revelation. And so what I realized after the fact is really um, looking at these images that Jamel had on a daily basis, edit, the editing process, going through his it really was a moment to help me process the totality of what I was going through. Mm. And in a lot of ways, I mean, just seeing these beautiful, beautiful, just gorgeous grand women um, living their daily lives and being reflected back to me really at the time helped me mm. not want to give up. Really, that's the short of that's it, powerful. right? That's real though. That's the short of it. Um, the other thing I want to add, so for Jamel, it's really about memory. For me, again, it's about transforming this trauma. But along with memory, something really interesting came up a couple weeks ago um, with my family. So Jamel and I did this really powerful um, interview a couple weeks ago. And my family, you know, I was really on my family because we don't really talk about what happened. Like, sort of. Like, we talk about my sister, but we don't really, you know? Mm -hmm. So we did the article. Jamel and I did the interview, excuse me. And um, I was on everybody in my family. Did you read the article? Mm -hmm. Did you read the article? I sent it to my two nephews. I sent it to my niece, whose mother it was mm -hmm. that was taken from us, unfortunately. I sent it to my mother. I sent it to my sisters. Did you read the article? Did you read the article? So some of them did, some of them didn't. So my mom, again, mom, did you read the article? So she's like, oh, I'm gonna read it, I'm gonna read it. So I'm gonna send it to you again. So she reads it, she doesn't say nothing to me. That night, I wake up in the middle of the night and she's in the bed and she's going, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And I'm like, mom, what's wrong? So she's like, nothing, nothing. It wasn't until two days later my mom says to me, she was like, you know, Janelle, I read the article. She was just like, you know, that night when I was just calling out Jesus, 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 she was just like, it's just like everything came back. Mm -hmm. She's like, everything came back and I didn't know how to deal with it. She said, but I'm so proud that you did this. She said, I just don't understand. Like, you're the youngest. Like, how would you know? Like, how did you know to even communicate this in this way through this artist and through she's like I don't understand but it's just like that's really the kind of stuff that God does mm -hmm. um with my niece I'll tell you briefly my niece who was two at the time and who was left in the house with my sister's body for over 12 hours when my sister was was murdered my niece all this time never knew what happened to her mother? Mm -hmm. She just knew that she was taken from us because we never had that conversation. So there were a series of conversations that needed to be had in order to process all of this. This is very much an exhibition, but it's also an experience, right? And I'm using Jamel's work as a catalyst to have not only this conversation about my family in this very personal moment, but also about women in general or those who identify as women in general, but also about men, whether you know it or not, right? And how we show up for women, how we show up for women, how we protect our women in this society. Yeah. Is that of importance to anyone? Mm. How do we demonstrate that? And so I say in the first room, it's very much for me, the first room when you go into the show, I say it's, it's, it's really like in my mind, there are a number of facets to the show, but the first room in particular is really a visual representation of the exchange we saw between Cory Booker 
and Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. Mm -hmm. That's the conversation I'm leading with in the show. That's profound. That's profound. And that was a beautiful moment because that was one of the first times I publicly seen a brother stand up in such an eloquent mm -hmm. and impassioned and authentic way for a sister who's under attack. And we got to do we, we got to do more of it. And, you know, it's tough because sometimes you don't realize what's at stake. You don't necessarily realize that you're not showing up the way that you need to show up. You know, I, my, my sister has gone through some things, uh, you know, many of which we didn't know about because she didn't tell us. And I was like, what? You keep moving. Mm. You move from L.A. and then you move back here and then you move or whatever. And your baby daddy, he's like, what's going on? It wasn't until years later that you know, we found out some things that I won't share her business, but we found out some things that we didn't necessarily know. But I also started to understand, maybe I should have known, maybe I should have looked deeper. How did I fail her? You know what I mean? Like I can't read minds, I can't do all the things, but at the same time, what could I have done better? What, and just mm -hmm. the care, just to ask that question, to be caring about that, is the first step towards being better, towards showing up, towards being there in ways that that sisters really need uh, and, and desire and deserve for us to be. Um, you you touched on so many things. Oh, excuse me. I just want to say one thing because yeah. I could just bring it back to this show. I mean, I think about different periods of my life, and even with this show, I mean, my voice is more. Um, in some people's eyes, like I know who I am, but in some people's eyes, my voice is more amplified because I'm in conversation with Jamel Shabazz and Ricky Day. My conversation or my voice is more amplified when I um, first presented the show in Austin because I was working with Jamel Shabazz. I was always the same person. I always had the same mind. I always had the same gifts. I always had the same talents. I always showed up this way. But it wasn't until I was in conversation with certain people that all of a sudden, you know, some people, not all, because, you know, I have people that know who I am, but some people, not all, began to take me more seriously. Mm -hmm. And what a shame, because I've always been who I am. Absolutely. And, you know, what's profound about that, um, and this is not about me, this is just this telling the truth of this, this moment. What's profound about that is when you do the work internally, you start to look at things differently. You start to turn things on their head. And full disclosure, so Janelle approached me and said, hey, we've got this wonderful show and I'd really like to, if you could, I'd love to have a conversation with you about the show. And I thought, well, of course, I mean, you're Janelle Ajani, and I'm sure the work is amazing because I love what you do with basketball, of course. But then for me, what emerged was, how wonderful would it be to have Jamel included so that he could celebrate Janelle in the world mm. in addition to what Janelle's going to share? Because on some level, I was like, wait, and I thought, I, mean, I went back and forth for like three days about that. I'm like, wait. Is this, am I doing the thing that people do? Or am I, because I know what my goal is in the moment, right? But am I doing the thing that people do? And you just, again, thinking about that, being insightful about that, I think is important because you, so many of us passively do the things that we've been conditioned to do that we don't understand that we're working against the things that we say we want to do. You know what I mean? And even in that moment, I, you know, I had that conversation with you. I was like, well, let's talk about this. And how do you feel? Because I wanted to know what worked best for you, how you felt, because I didn't want to do that thing. That wasn't the point. But the point was, this queen has been doing this amazing work. And I know X number of people are going to care. They're going to listen. We're going to have an engaging conversation. But wow, I get to celebrate two amazing brother, a brother and a sister and their relationship. It's your relationship and the way you relate as a Black woman and a Black man, as Black creatives, as Black intellectuals, as Black scholars. There's something about that that just adds more fuel to it. And so I had to do that gut check to make sure it was coming from the right place. But so many of us, myself included in the past, may not have done that work. And that, that, that work is important. And that leads to another question I was going to ask, which was about the, the power of art 
to help people be aware of and engage in what uh, Dr. Sean Genright calls mirror work, right? Where, you know, th- so many of us, we move through life looking at life through the various lenses that we've been given. You know, oh, you know, this woman, the white woman's going to come over here and she's probably going to do A, B, and C because we've been conditioned to have a certain lens because of experiences that we've had, things we've seen on the news, whatever. It may be valid, may not be valid, may be valid most times, but it's not necessarily always the case. So we all know that we have these lenses that we look at every situation through. And so each, all three of us could be looking at a situation, we're gonna view it similarly because we're African-American, but we're gonna view it differently because we're male or we're female, we're younger, we're older. Lenses are what we experience the world through. But what's critical is to do what he calls the mirror work, where you stop for a moment and you look inside and you ask yourself, how am I showing up? Why am I showing up the way I'm showing up? What's influencing how I show up? Am I always mindful of or taking the time to think about how I show up? And my question for either of you is, what do you think is the the possibility and the power of art to help people think about and engage in that very important mirror work? Because I'm convinced the world doesn't get better uh, without a couple of things happening. One, us embracing love, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but Mm. really engaging in this mirror work, understanding how you're showing up. And I think it's important because as I watch so many of the struggles that we're going through as a society and as a people, you know, on one hand, people are like, I want freedom, freedom and justice for everybody. And then I'm watching that very same group of people be homophobic or transphobic or all those things. And then I'm watching people that are, you know, the, being bullied on one level. And then as soon as they get a little freedom or they're engaging in this dialogue about what matters to them, I'm watching them in my very, in front of my eyes, turn into the bullies that they've been a victim of. And so I think mirror work is critical. What do you guys think, or either one of you, or both of you, what do you think is the power and the, the, the possibility and the responsibility of art and artists to help people think about and engage in that mirror work? For me, it, it's so important. It goes back to what I shared earlier about the role of the artist. You know, we have a responsibility. We've been given this divine gift. And I think it's very imperative that we look within, we look at that mirror and ask ourselves, ask ourselves the questions. What is my purpose in life? I have this gift. What can I do? Let me look around and make an assessment of my community and the world. How can I use my voice, my platform to bring some type of joy into this world right here? And with me at this particular stage in my life, I've done a lot in terms of with that healing process. What's happening to me now is that I'm being asked to curate exhibitions. It's a new role that I truly embrace because now I'm in a position to reach out to artists who are doing work that is very important to me, but more important to the world. And many of them don't have a platform to, 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 to display it. So as a curator now, I, I can now go to them and say, look, I've seen your work in the albinism. I think it's an important story. Uh, or this young man, you did two combat tours in, in, in Iraq. I need your voice on this table. The black police officer that uses photography as therapy. Not only do I want your, your, your imagery, but we need to have artists talk to have conversations. So as a curator, what I strive to do now is use my uh, 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 platform to bring other artists in because we need all hands on deck right now. I'm calling on all conscious artists. And when I look to enlist people for the different projects that I'm working on, the thing I ask them, I want you to focus on something that's close to your heart. So whatever's close to your heart that needs to be addressed, let me know what it is because I want it all to be relevant. It's all relevant. Regardless, it's all relevant. So it's the artist that can change this because we have this talent. And like I said before, you could be a poet, a painter, a, a photographer, a musician. We need everybody right now. I've never seen any. For me, my generation in particular, all I've known, and I say it in all my interviews, all my life, all I've known is war. It's been war forever. And as a conscious person in my study of both Life Magazine, National Geographic, all the publications, not only the wars that we know about, there's all these other wars that are going on. We got drought, we got global warming, we got all this conflict going on. So it's the artists that can now be used as the frontline soldiers. Gordon spoke about the camera being his weapon of choice and how that could be used to break down stereotypes and negativity. We have, we have to do that right now. It's very important that we look within ourselves and come to the realization that we are dealing with a lot of problems right now. I'm not sure how how aware people are very with things that are going on, not only in this country, but around the world all the time. And it overwhelms me. 
And like I said before, the politicians and religious leaders have failed. This is out of their hands right now. So it's the art artists who've really always been persecuted, but now we have to take the stance and realize that the harvest is ripe, but the labors are few. And we need all hands on deck right now to use whatever platform that you have to address issues that are close to your heart. I don't care what it is. If it's something that's close to your heart that could help in making the world a better place, we need you right now. So when you think about imagery, you know, when, like for me as, as an artist, when I make an image, I'm always the, the, the what I look for. The cornerstone of my work is love and joy. You know, that's what I, what I want to get for because we need that. We see the negativity. And Janelle knows how I feel about that because it's overwhelming to me. But the only the only way to balance out the negativity is to, is to show positivity, to give it balance. And we need that now because the four forces that be are really pushing that negativity out there. Because with that cell phone now, so much is being documented. And it's a reality, but it could lead to depression and a sense of hopelessness. And we got to balance that out right now. So we got to get all artists on deck to sit down and take a moment of pause. And in your prayers and your meditation, seek clarity on what your purpose is right now. Because we're living in such turbulent times and, and, and we have to come to that realization. What can we do to make this world a better place as an artist? And I think that the artists have the answers, both in their personal work, but in these these group curations, these exhibitions, you know, they could make a difference. Like, like I just a, a show concluded last week in uh, the Cochran, Washington, D.C. called Framing Fatherhood, where I was invited to share my work on fatherhood. And in that process, I was able to suggest other photographers that came forward, thus giving them an opportunity. And we had a very important conversation on fathers. Because that's a big issue within our community, but even the largest community. So it was very important that we came together and showed different perspectives on fathers. And it helped a lot of people with the healing. And at the same time, it sparked conversations about fatherhood and even inspired others to be better fathers. So artists got to look into the mirror and got to, we got to ask those questions and look around at the world and say, what can I do right now to make a difference in this world? What, why do I have this divine gift? And if possible, what can I do on my social media feed to try to bring joy in the world? Because it's easy to bring negativity. We can show the fights and we can say bad things, but let's try to do some good deeds right now. And it all makes all the difference in the world. There's a lot of pain out there right now. Let's let's strive to be healers. There's nothing wrong with being a healer right now. You know what I mean? So I, I want people to just think about that. How can we be healers and even start within our own families? Sometimes that's where all the pain is at. But let us try to be a light during these dark times because so many people are going through challenges and throughout various platforms, we can be an illumination of light to a lot of people. Absolutely. Janelle, do you want to respond? Yeah. I think Janelle got it on that one. I feel the same. I feel the same. I'm on the verge of wrapping us up, but I just had a couple of more points I just wanted to touch on before we go. Uh, you know, this podcast exists as an extension of my, uh, you know, theological studies at, here at Theological Seminary. Mm -hmm. I say this because, um, as I shared with uh, with uh, Jamel before the conversation, and just Janelle, I think I, I shared with you in a previous conversation that I feel like so much of what we're facing right now is humanity is in the midst of a, a identity crisis. We've literally forgot who we are and whose we are, right? And not knowing who you are, you try to fill the void that exists inside you, uh, you know, material things, fame, followers, fortune, all, all the stuff. And when that stuff inevitably falls short, uh, the go-to for most people, and I do mean most people, is to feel better about who you are by diminishing other people. And that's where all these systems come from. That's where the isms and the phobias come from, from mm -hmm. racism and sexism, the gay homophobia and transphobia, all the phobias, all the isms come from trying to make yourself feel better based on diminishing other people. And it just doesn't work. And it's evil. And it's making the world the miserable place that it is. And it drives capitalism, which in many ways is destroying the world when you think about the way we're consuming things and the way we're destroying the planet in the process. I do believe personally, and this is my belief, that love is really the only way that we're going to get beyond this. And I don't mean romantic love as sold to us by Hollywood. I don't mean what they wrote in fairy tales. Oh, I fall in love. I mean the definition of love that um, I, you know, got from Ed Scott, Ed Scott Peck, and I got this through Bell Hooks, who introduced me to the concept originally in her book all about love. And the definition is the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another spiritual growth. The mm -hmm. will, which implies intent to make yourself available for the purpose of nurturing your own or another spiritual growth. 
if you guys agree with that definition and at least one of the ways to describe love, I am curious for you, what has been and what will continue to be the role of love in the work that you are creating and in what you're doing in the world? Well, as I stated earlier, love will always be the cornerstone of my work, you know, because I know that, like you said, we need love in the world today. So for me, as an image maker, I always look to capture it, to show it. I need to see it to get balance. So it, 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 it's, it's number one. When it comes down to it, that love is what I look for in relationships and friendships, you know, in animals, you know, relationship between man and animal, man with, the, with nature, it's, it's that love. And, we, and, and Stevie Wonder really spoke about in this song, you know, love is, is needed in the world today. Mm -hmm. You know, that sums it up, but that's what I feel that we need it. So I have to do it. I have a responsibility. Yes, the pain is out there and it's the reality. But I'm redirecting my lens now towards the love. There's so much pain out there. Others can photograph that. But for me, I have to bring people together. My most recent image really represents love because it's an artist talk I did with the artist that I was uh, the show that I curated in Brooklyn called The Brooklyn Connection. Mm -hmm. But one of the highlights of that event for me was all the artists and the invited guests that came out before I even really started. I brought everybody together in a spirit of unity for a group photograph to show that we met on this path for a reason. And what I want to do is, is freeze this moment in time and show how the language of art brought us together. And this photograph represents that, you know, so I strive to do that it, it, with all these opportunities I have, even with people that don't know each other, let's come together in the spirit of love because we met on this path for a reason. And in closing, as I shared before, the harvest is ripe, but the ladies is few. Let us go back out in our community with utilizing that spirit of love and try to make the world a better place because that is the foundation of our survival right now is love. And we really need it right now because hate, hate is out there and it's ever present. But if we put on our spiritual armor and we hold up that banner of love, we can really make this world a better place. And Sister Janelle, last word from you. I think for me, the manifestation of love really has... Uh, less to do about the work that I will produce in the world and more so about how I want to continue to cultivate my love of God mm. and really understand his love for me. And along with that, um, show love towards myself, right? And so I think with those with those facets, the love will automatically show up in my work. Um, that is why, you know, I believe that um, the Peace of the Queen exhibition is such a beautiful show. Um, that show manifested through a lot of fasting, a lot of prayer, um, and the love will, will naturally show up in my work if I, I just focus on those things. Well said as always. I am, again, as I said at the beginning, but now after having this conversation, even more grateful for both of you spending a good chunk of your Saturday afternoon with me for sharing your gifts with the world and, and being true lights uh, in this world. I, I wish you both the best. Uh, I'm not sure why I'm saying that that the way, because I'm going to talk to both of you sometime soon. I am sure, J Jamel, you're going to be, I'm going to give Jamel my number to give to you, but yeah, we got to all stay in touch uh, and, and stay in, in, in community because it's going to take a community of us to make any kind of impact in this world. And I'm so grateful to both of yeah. you. Uh, before we go, yeah. let's recap. The show is, Janelle, you do the marketing plugs. The show is called Where <laughs> It's At, When It Closes, and all the information. The show is called Peace to the Queen. It is now on view at the Carver Museum in Austin, Texas, and it has been extended until September 17th. And I'm looking forward to all of you coming out to see the show. Amazing. And for my New York audience, I have an exhibition up at the Bronx Museum called Eyes of the, of the Streets. Uh, and uh, that exhibition closes on uh, September 4th. Amazing. So, uh, Bronx Museum. It's a solo exhibition. You know, it, it's it's very important for the New York audience. It's 40 years of photography. So I'm honored to have two back-to-back -back shows in two major cities that can serve as healing places. 
See, these plugs are important because I didn't even know that show was up. And now I'm about to, I might even leave. Well, it's too late now, but <laughs> I'm going to see that show. Uh, and I'll do my own little plug. I'm in a group show at Chambre called Ben Scene. And I've got two images of Jamel. And one of them, I think you might really like because it's about fatherhood. And it's a really loving image. Okay, very good. Image or whatever. But uh, can y'all drop your social media for, I'll put it in the show notes, but can you just real, real quick drop them for everybody so they can follow you guys? Because I'm telling you guys, listeners, you need to follow these two people. Uh, sisters first. So you can follow me on IG at J-A-Y-N Ajani. And I'm on all social media platforms. Love to connect with you. And my main foundation is IG right now. And that's Jamel Shabazz, uh, J-A-M-E-L-S-H-A-B-A-Z-Z. Jamel Shabazz, Janelle, thank you both for joining me. This has been a pleasure, even more than I thought it was going to. Was, I was hyped. And it's even better than I thought it was going to be. I thank you both. And have a, have a wonderful day. And likewise to you, brother. Appreciate you. Continue the great work. Thank you. Yes. Blessings to you. Thank you.